good morning, uh, IOL students. This is your tutor, uh, Absalom Kahumba, and I'm responsible for natural science and health uh, one. I'll be talking to you today about some of the aspects that are related to your uh, 2020 examination. But as you already know, this is actually examination-based contact classes. So that's what I'll be dealing with. So should you have any questions pertaining to what I'll be discussing today, you are allowed or you have the liberty of trying to contact me at my either cell phone number or sending me an, e an email. But if you'd like to call me, so you could do call the 081 124 So 081 one two four six seven five three or alternatively you can email me at uh, uh, absalom kahumba at unam.na so those are the two contact details that you can use to find me at any place or any time that you will so wish um basically what i will start with here i will start uh, looking at uh, the core three core functions of public health as we know, there are these uh, uh, core functions which the health centers should be able to do. Because when you do not have the core functions, and then you don't know what to do. So I have realized in most of the questions uh, that have been previously asked, uh, students fail to uh, handle some of these questions. And the main core functions of the public health care are public health, uh, health centers are normally uh, have to look at the assessment and the monitoring of the health of communities and also population at risk to mainly identify the health problem and also prioritize. So they have those priorities as well. And secondly, mainly they have to formulate uh, uh, public policies that are designed to solve uh, identified local and national health problems and priorities as well. And the last one here is actually to ensure uh, that all people have access to appropriate and cost-effective uh, 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 care, which normally includes the health promotion, the disease prevention services, and also evaluation of the effectiveness of that uh, care. So, in principle, these are the three core functions of the public uh, health. Uh, the other aspect that I have to look at, and uh, I've just taken a number of them from different units that I need to highlight to you. Uh, one of them here is actually uh, how sound from the uh, learner env uh, local environment that are mainly transmitted through the air. So there are some questions that you may need to ask yourself, uh, such as some of them that are indicated here. The first question that you should ask yourself is that uh, why is sound clear at night when it's cool? So you realize it's, 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 at night it's more sound, sound is more clear. So why is it so? So in case, I mean, in most cases, if human uh, could react or people could react to sounds, they can hear it at, 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 at one time. It will be a disaster because there are so many uh, sounds at one uh, point. Now, what sound, what sound do you hear at night that you cannot hear during the day? Those are some of the questions you see you need to ask yourself. So what are those sounds that you may hear at night that you, may, that you, cannot, that you cannot hear at, uh, during the day? So what you need to understand from this principle is that uh, uh, the vibration of, uh, vibrating objects, ob uh, 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 objects normally produce sound. So vibrating objects, they produce sound. So, so now, how sound in an environment are transmitted through the air? So what happens is that uh, the cold, uh, cold air has a high speed of sound. Uh, this is just because the particles are so compacted. So when the particles are, co are so compacted, the, the, the sound uh, uh, travels much uh, at a high speed. So that makes now the sound travel uh, faster because the vibration from one particle to the other is much faster, and there's also a lower thermal dispersion, which tend to diffuse the sound energy. 
So additionally, it's quite at night as well. So your brain does not have uh, to filter out many different sounds from one. So it's quite quiet. It's so quiet. So you can easily clear, clearly uh, 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 find out that this is the type of sound that you are hearing. So you can filter it out nicely. So, but that, that, that is actually done by the brain. So the human brain is equipped with a, a sensory uh, filter that filters all, all sounds received through the ear. So that's why you, when you hear so many noises and sounds, you tend to filter which one you may be able to uh, be interested in and try to filter it and uh, see if you can hear it uh, uh, appropriately or clearly. So the sounds seems interesting or frightening is usually, is usually pro, um, uh, process such that it requires now a reaction from a person. So if people could react uh, to all different sounds from living and unliving which are around them, they could go crazy. You see? So because there are so many sounds around us that are hardly uh, 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 mind all of them. So you realize only a specific sound that they tend to filter and then make it more clear. But we are surrounded by so many uh, different sounds, which, are, which can be coming from living and non-living uh, uh, other organisms. So uh, the other aspect that we need, we need to look at today is a common uh, pre-adolescence behavior. So as you are uh, uh, maybe a primary school uh, teacher, you need to understand the common pre-adolescence behavior. So because these behaviors are normally divided in two sections, which are either the language and the gesture, which are used by the pre-adolescence uh, uh, learners. So we'll first look at uh, or start with the language. So you, you, you could see that... Uh, a seven-year-old uh, learner who, who either have uh, hands on on the hip, they hold themselves like that at the hips, uh, they declare differently, you can't make me, mom. So those are some of the language they use. But when you look at uh, the, uh, a four-year-old, uh, uh, those ones tag instantly on mom, they hold the, uh, the, the, the sleeves, and loudly you whining, mom. So while mom is trying to actually maybe uh, 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 chat to an important client who she may just uh, might, might have just met in the supermarket, but uh, the, the four year old will be now holding on the mom's uh, sleeves, just mom shouting all that. So that type of language. But you need to now bear with those learners because that is actually normal. But when you look at, when you compare it to a nine-year-old uh, uh, that tries out four letters maybe that they have learned at school uh, or on, uh, on, on his or three-year-old sister, you will often hear this type of word from maybe a three or nine years old, like, Mom, I hate you. I wish I never had a brother or a sister. Or, I don't love you anymore. You don't love me anymore. I wish I or you were dead. Shut up. You can't make me. You are stupid. You never do anything for me. So you expect all of those to come from uh, the pre-adolescence uh, learners. So those are the languages that you expect at all times. So hence you are, I mean, be, uh, hence before you are uh, uh, as a parent or a teacher, you conclu could conclude that uh, your children have been maybe sent to you as a punishment or sin committed in the previous life or before you say you can't teach primary school anymore anymore or anymore take heart such behavior uh, no matter how annoying or embarrassing it is it's completely normal you need to expect it at all time from uh, the little ones because it's normal for them it's actually called the provocative communication and it is a uh, actually, natural uh, and it's it's like it or not, it's ne uh, it's it's necessary. It's a natural part of growing up. Uh, everyone has to undergo such a process, and it's not actually a way of maybe showing to you that they are rude, 
that is actually normal. It's just a way that they undergo when they are growing up. But you need to accept it. These are some of the languages that you are likely to experience in at 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 at, at any time from an adolescent, a pre-adolescent uh, learner. Uh, the gesture. When you look at the gesturing, this is actually uh, what happens normally in children. So uh, children learn different body language from peers. Some are good, but some are bad. But they all learn from that. But you 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 find that in boys, uh, boys will mostly stand with their hands in their pocket. When they come to you, they stand in front of you, but with their hands in pocket. Either they will scratch their heads or when lying. Mm, they are lying. So you can see someone is trying to lie to you, but they start scratching their heads. So it's already an indication. So that gesturing of either scratching their head or is an indication that they are lying. They either look down when they are feeling ashamed. They don't want to look at you because you might end up spotting out that uh, uh, there is something that they are saying which is untrue. So they will look down because they are ashamed. They also show a little finger when they are cursing. That's what they do. Or cry when angry and laugh when happy. So when they are angry, they just cry. But when they are happy, they will start laughing out loudly. But uh, particularly for girls, they tend to be so shy. Uh, and that is normal for, for, for girls. Uh, uh, like playing uh, mother's role because they will be future mothers. So they cry also when unhappy and they pay too much attention to their hair. So that's what they concentrate on. So these are type of gestures that you are likely to experience at all time in your class. And the language that I've indicated earlier, those are always expected at all time in your class. So you need to be with them, and that's normal. So expected at all times. So you don't have to uh, get worried so much when you are provoked by such ways being used in class. So be be at, at utmost level that it is likely to happen at all times. So the other uh, uh, aspect that you have to deal with also, we need to look at how you would write a, out a game-based lesson for teaching about uh, gender behavior in community. So because sometimes it's quite good when you have a game-based lesson that you need to teach to, I mean, to teach about gender in any community. So the game-based lesson uses competitive exercise, either pitting uh, uh, the learner uh, uh, against each other or getting them to challenge themselves in order to mot actually motivate them to learn better. Games, they help learners to learn better because they are more involved. So uh, games uh, often have a, fa a fantasy element that actually engage players in learning activity through story lines. They can tell stories or so or have a role to play. So, you also create a true, uh, truly education game. Uh, no, now, when, what we need to do uh, to create a true uh, educational game, you as an instructor need to make sure that the learning uh, 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 material is essential actually to, uh, to score and winning. So, they should be scoring and they should be a winning team. So, what is this uh, game? Uh, uh, base uh, lesson. So it's particularly an element of engaging educational classroom uh, game and uh, categories of game that can be adopted from uh, learning. This may include video game which can be either digital game based learning or board and card games with the descriptions of uh, uh, geoscience game. So you need to actually have a description of how that game is played and do you explain it clearly to your learners how it can be played and you uh, let them uh, partake in such a game. So why use game uh, based lesson? Uh, not only uh, uh, does uh, the integration, it only does not do the integration of learning with game making science more fun it also actually motivates learners to learn. And it has the immense, uh, or it messes them in the material so they can learn more effectively. It encourages them to learn. 
from their own mistake. They will make a mistake during the game, but let let, let them get uh, involved. So because they will learn easily from the mistake that they will make. So how do you teach now uh, 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 the uh, the game based lesson? Uh, you need to integrate le uh, learning and also uh, gameplay. So without how uh, to give learners point, uh, I mean, you need to work out how to give learners point to accomplish a certain goal in the lesson plan. Uh, you also need to decide on what rewards you give the winners, the victors. You need to reward them. And you also have to create the game pieces. Uh, you need to create them, what to play, if it's card, you need to give each one the cards to play with so that uh, they end up partaking in that and then challenging each other. So whoever wins should be rewarded. You also need to test your game before you involve the learners. See if it works. If it works, and meaning you have already pre-tested it, then if it works, you can now involve because you should also be aware that you need to be the empire. So because you are actually officiating between the uh, learners when they are playing and you also guide them, but you let them also uh, learn through mistakes and you correct them when they need that. It's very important and you need to actually organize it and see that it uh, accomplishes the purpose that you actually designed it for. Uh, the other aspect that we can also look at is um, Ecline. Ecline is a, it's a gland uh, uh, that secretes most water and salt and are basically used by the body for temperature control. So this is actually a gland and its purpose is, its major function is actually to uh, secrete water and salt. And it's because these ones are normally used by uh, the body to control its temperature. And uh, the, the equine uh, glands are located around the body, but most, uh, uh, most uh, profuse around the soles of feet, the palm of your hand, the forehead. They look, they look like uh, coiled tubes, uh, spiraling towards the, the exterior of the skin. So, and they have that function, they function for that purpose. So, those glands are so important in the body. And uh, most of the students that normally, they uh, actually have problem in defining what it is or explaining what it is and its function. So, these are the functions and that's what it does normally. And where uh, there are also specific places where you find them, the sole of your feet, if you look at the best, that's where they are found. The palm of your hand, and or your hands and the forehead. Um, also need to know uh, to look at why we have a claim uh, like the sun rises up in the east and sets in the west. Why is this false? Why is a claim like the sun rises up in the east and sets in the west is false? Why is it false? So basically, the Earth is rotating on its own west. I mean, its own, own from west, uh, from west to east. So it's it's it, it's rotating on its own axis. So the movement of the Earth uh, to east causes the sun now to look like it's coming from uh, coming up in the east and going down in the west. So humanly speaking, it looks as if the sun is the one moving, but Due to the movement of the earth, the sun does not rotate, but it's stationary while the earth is rotating on its own axles. So it's actually the, the, the earth that is spinning all the time, rotating. So that's what makes uh, the earth lose, I mean, the sun looks like it's coming up uh, from the east uh, to, to and down in the west. So that means the earth is the one that is moving around itself. But the sun itself does not move at all. So it's the air that moves. The sun is stationary. It's just where it is. It doesn't move. So that's when the rota this rotation of uh, the earth on its axle makes it more, uh, it makes the sun look like 
it moves it, it rises from the east and down into the west but it's actually the air that moves you need to understand that very carefully uh, the other aspect that we also have to look at is the different digestive system component of the body our body has different parts and uh, the, the most important part of our digestive systems are as indicated here we'll start from uh, uh, the mouth the mouth part that's where you actually uh, that's where the digestion system starts uh, the pharynx that is actually the box voice sort of type of uh, uh, component and now here you have oral cavity that's the mouth part uh, you have uh, down there you have the oval uh, you have the tongue so uh, down there uh, but you can say that you also have the salivary glands that are operating or helping the digestive system such as the parotide and uh, submandibular, you have also sublingual. Those are the uh, the, the uh, yellow type of areas there that you can see. Those are salivary glands that help to facilitate the digestion. You have now the orange channel, which is the, the part of the digestive system, which is the oesophagus, starting from the mouth, going down uh, to the stomach. Uh, you have the stomach there. The um, uh, red part here that you can see, that's actually the uh, liver. And you also have the gut bladder, that's where bile is collected normally from toxic substances. And then you have the pancreas, uh, but it also have a pancreatic uh, duct. Uh, you have now the uh, intestines, small intestines. Uh, which are three, duodenum, uh, uh, jejunum, and ileum. Those are the three small intestines. We also have the colon there, that's the largest intestine particularly. Uh, the transverse colon, ascending colon, and descending colon. However, you have also have the cecum below here, close to the appendix. And the... Uh, Part that goes up uh, last to, towards the anus is actually the uh, rectum. So these are the digestive system component of our body. We need to know them and also be able to differentiate them. Know which ones, uh, which one is which, and uh, do not confuse it. Uh, I've realized most most of the time uh, people tend to confuse uh, small intestines with large intestines, but those ones are quite distinct. So there it is. Uh, we'll basically now also look at uh, flowering and non-flowering plants. Uh, we have uh, plants that are flowering. Some do not uh, produce flowers. We'll see what happens. So all flowering plants are advanced form and they have a vascular system. So they have a vascular system. Whereas the non-flowering plant uh, basically complies both the non-vascular form particularly the mosses, that's a plant, and the vascular form are normally experienced in ferns and pies. But these ones are not common here. Uh, they are in a cold, uh, normally in a, in a cold planet, but the mosses, you can find them at uh, coastal uh, areas. So flowering plants, they bear, or they have the male and female parts, uh, either on the same flower or on different, I mean on different plant, on the same plant or on different plants. But uh, the non-flowering plants do not have such uh, uh, plant parts. So you realize that the majority of flowering plants, they produce seeds, and these seeds are used for new uh, uh, plant development. So the majority of non-flowering plants, uh, uh, with some exception, produce tiny spores for propagation. Spores are actually the the minute typical single uh, single cells so those ones are ma mainly common and they use those for propagation particularly in, in uh, they're quite common in, uh, in, uh, in fungus 
you realize fungus produce that's how they i mean they pro propagate through spores wherever it is you will find that this propagation of a new uh, fungus there like mushroom as well so that's a type of uh, that's how mushroom also uh, propagate uh, seeds produced by uh, flowering flowers, uh, flowering, um, flowering uh, plants, are normally enclosed into uh, fruits. Uh, particularly if you have uh, maybe a mango, you realize that in between or in the middle, there is actually a, 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 a seed that is actually enclosed in the fruit that you eat, we normally eat. While in case of uh, in the case uh, in seed derived from uh, 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 non falling plants, the, that is not actually the case. So there are no uh, uh, seeds enclosed in the fruit in non flowering plants. So in flowering plants, uh, the uh, saprophyte phase is actually dominant. But when you look at uh, non flowering plants, saprophytes and the gametes are independent, particularly in the fern. And the gametes uh, phase is actually dominant in uh, the moss. And I have indicated earlier that the fern, uh, uh, the fern here, uh, the, those ones uh, produce or they are more vascular forms. And uh, the, the 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 other one, which is the 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 fern here, is independent. But you realize here. Moss has more dominant, uh, I mean, dominant uh, 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 gametophytes as compared to uh, flowering plants. But this is actually occurring in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a non-flowering uh, plants. Now, I also need to f uh, uh, to look at how different material degrade, different at different rates. So we have different materials that degrade differently. At different times and that is actually depending on the environment where they are so the term material breakdown actually refers to the change I mean to chemical changes uh, that material undergo uh, due to chemical uh, chemicals like uh, acid physical changes like maybe wind or water or by the process of decay uh, by small organisms such as bacteria or fungi so it takes some material uh, years to break down. Some it only takes a, a day or some days. Yet other take like hours or minutes to just decompose. So they, de they decompose at a different rate. So this is actually due to the fact that decomposition is dependent on environment where the material is being decomposed. That would determine how fast a material should degrade. So this is why they will degrade differently at all different times. So, for example, look at uh, how fast a steel rust mm -hmm. form of decomposition in humid, salt, air uh, environment, particularly the cost, such as Swakop, when you compare it to a dry environment such as the window. So, it will degrade much faster in a humid area uh, or environment, such as the cost, and quite slowly in an environment that is more drier, like window. So a material would degrade differently depending on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, on the on the area where it, it, it degrades and also the process that it undergoes, those chemical changes, the way they react. If it reacts so fast that it gets decomposed, it will degrade very fast. But there are some agents that normally help that process, such as bacteria or fungi, depending if it's an organism, I mean an organic a matter that has to be decomposed or not. But water, wind might also help out in the process. Uh, we actually looked at different uh, flowering plants over uh, the previous slide, but uh, now we will now outline uh, different parts of a flower because a flower is made up of different uh, parts. It has the female uh, parts and also male parts. The female parts here, the pistil, is composed of a stigma up there in the middle and you have the style, now that's where the stigma is, and the ovary where uh, that is actually where the, 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 the seeds will be formed. 
but you have the stamen which is a male uh, part of the flower it has the anther the top of it there and then you have the filament that an the anther is actually on top of the filament but you also have now the uh, uh, pale red parts of the flower which are called petals and you are now you now have the middle i mean in, in the ovary there you have the ovule with its embryo sac that's now where the seed will be formed and that that will be part of the seed and where the, the where the where the where the i mean it, it will be part of the the fruit where the seed will be enclosed so the green part here that uh, at the bottom of the uh, petals actually the sepal you have the round part of it which is the receptacle and what holds it up there is the peduncle so these are the different parts of the flower so we need to know to know them because a, a flower has a different parts and we need to know which ones are which when it's open because sometimes you can find that flower is enclosed it did not open widely then you may not be able to see all the other male and female parts because the sepal crosses it down or up like that so but what but when it opens you will be able to identify all these parts of the flower clearly that is the last part that uh, i had to deal with and uh, talk to you about I actually would like you to go through them and not only these ones plus other uh, units in your module and uh, see if you can understand everything clearly, make time to study it carefully and whenever you have problem or you need clarification at a different aspect, I'm available at all time and there for your assistance. Uh, I would like to wish you all the best for your examination and I thank you so much.